short while he had had enough of it entirely. So he arranged for her and her baby to move into a home for unwed mothers. Now she had stayed with her boyfriend Herman for a little while, but at some point his father told him something similar to, you don't have to buy the cow to get the milk for free, something like that. But I imagine he said it in German. Of course he said it in German. And so they broke up. And she found herself a new man. And she got pregnant again at 18 years old. They wound up breaking up while she was still pregnant. I believe that it was her idea for them to break up. And shortly before she was due to give birth, somebody broke in through her window and R-A-P-E-D her at gunpoint. Following this whole nightmare, her stepfather arranged for her to attend reform school. And she was so traumatized and depressed over the whole thing, as you can imagine. She attempted to take her life. Luckily, though, she was saved, as was the life of her unborn child. And she gave birth to the child and put her up for adoption. Now, here's the thing that differs in a lot of the articles. Many articles say that she gave up the first baby for adoption before any of this happened. You know, that she had given up that baby, like, at infancy. But then other articles say she gave up the first baby later on. So, I'm going with that story. Okay, so at this point where we are, she still has the first baby, whose name, by the way, was Christina, or is Christina, and she just gave up her second baby for adoption. Okay, now, her stepfather died around this time, and she moved back into her mother's house. And she started getting into going to discotheques and going to a lot of parties. And she met a new boy. He was a hippie named Christian. And as the story goes, she slept with him on the first night when she met him at a party and she became pregnant. She was 22 at this time, so some time had passed since the last pregnancy, which was at 18, and the one before was at 16. And so she and Christian were a bit of an item, but not really, because she was also seeing a German businessman who was already married. And while she was pregnant, she went away uh, for a weekend with him to Belgium. And she asked him to leave his wife for her, but he said no. And then she damaged his car to retaliate. And Christian found out about this whole thing, and obviously he was very upset. But as soon as the baby was born, he was elated. And that happened on November 14th.
she did that, but for some reason, he R-A-P-E-D her, drove her out to the countryside and dumped her out of the car on the side of the road, so she had to find her own way home. Now, Christian knew about this and, you know, realized that she was clearly not being very loyal to him. And he became very depressed. He started going to brothels in Berlin himself. And he told Marianne about that. So she took it upon herself to go visit Berlin, find the first man that she could, and sleep with him and then come back and tell Christian about it. There was so much fighting and so many problems between the couple that they realized that Christina, Marianne's first daughter, was getting a bad education, was having a bad lifestyle, and that, supposedly, is when they put her up for adoption. At the point that she was already, like, an elementary school-aged child. So, anyway, Christian ended up selling this bar for a big profit. And he bought a steamship, which he had big plans for, but the plans never fruition for some reason, but he also bought a new bar, and that was in a town called Lubbock, Germany, and that bar was even more successful than the first one, but the couple had to work night and day at this bar, that's how busy it was, and Marianne didn't have anyone to watch Anna, so she would bring her to the bar with her all the time. Sometimes Anna would sleep at the bar. People would later 
for a 
she was just looking for attention. That the only reason she shot Grabowski was for attention. How could she actually even care about Anna to the extent that she would shoot this guy in a courtroom if she had been planning on giving her away to a yogi for adoption? That's what people were saying. Now, on November 2nd, 1982, she was charged in court with murder, but by March 2nd of 1983, she was convicted of manslaughter and unlawful possession of a firearm. The argument was that the murder, well, the shooting was not premeditated. She had the gun in her possession for protection after what had just happened to her own daughter. And she just, you know, was so swept away with emotion that she shot him. You know, so she had not planned it at all. So she was sentenced to six years in prison and she was released after serving three years. When she got out, she married a teacher and three years later they moved together to Ghana and they lived in a German camp where he taught German school. But they got divorced in 1990 and she moved Sicily, and she worked as an aide in hospice in Palermo. She was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer while she was in Sicily, and she returned to Germany at that point on September 21st of 1995. She appeared on a German television talk show, and she admitted she premeditated the killing of Grabowski. She said she wanted to enforce the law on him and she wanted to prevent him from spreading any more lies about Anna. Meaning, you know, he was lying when he said that Anna tried to extort him of money. That was a lie. And she couldn't listen to him tell any more lies. And she never expressed any remorse for her act of vengeance. On September 17th, 1996, Marianne passed away from pancreatic cancer. She was laid to rest next to her daughter, Anna in a cemetery in Lübeck, Germany. And that is the case. What are your thoughts? I will share some of mine. First of all, rest in peace to Anna. She was only seven years old. Her life was brutally stolen by a monster. And rest in peace to Marianne. Some people might see her as a villain. Others might see her as a hero. But she also had a rough life and died at a pretty young age. 
was murdered like this. Just because she had been planning on giving her up for adoption, which is, it's hard to imagine. You know, I can see that. I don't know how you take a seven-year-old and put them up for adoption. But that's not what we're here to talk about, really. She was about to do that. But her daughter wound up getting murdered by this horrible, horrible monster in this brutal way. And then put in a box by the canal. Is she not allowed to feel a huge loss and to mourn her daughter? And just completely be sick over what had happened. I think she still would have those feelings. So personally, I don't think she was trying to get attention. I think this is what she wanted to do. But that's not saying that I'm, I think vigilante justice is right. I'm just saying that is what I think she was trying to accomplish. He was not just trying to get attention. If you disagree with me, let me know. I'm interested to hear everyone's thoughts. Okay, so what about vigilante justice? Is it justified in a case like this? I mean, I know a lot of people will say yes. Okay. But here's what I'm thinking. This guy hadn't finished his trial yet. He had not been found guilty, which he certainly would have been found guilty. But it hadn't happened yet. He had not been sentenced. So before any of that could happen, she killed him. And it is said that he died an innocent man in the eyes of the law because of that. But wouldn't it be appropriate to wait and see what happens? He would very possibly have been given a sentence of life in prison. I realize that a sentence of life in prison will not bring back Anna and does not make up for what he did to Anna. But some would say that his life behind bars would have been far worse than his experience of having died right there in the courtroom. So, anyway, I guess there's a lot to think about here. I am going to end it here. Thank you so much for joining me today. seeing you.